Um, to get down to it then, because I know we've got a lot to talk about, um, to introduce our guest expert today, um, Dr. John Crow is consultant medical oncologist and has a particular interest in cancer genetics and ovarian cancer. He's also a senior clinical lecturer, lecturer in medical oncology at Imperial College London and a member of the translational research team within the Ovarian Cancer Action Research Centre. Um, just a bit of a caveat here, um, John is here to answer all your questions on PARP inhibitors, but this isn't a medical consultation. Um, so as always, we do advise you to consult your own medical team about your personal situation um, before you make any decisions on any part of this. So I'm going to hand over to John now to fill us in on lots of useful information, and then we will have time at the end for Q&A. So please do send your questions on, um, along as we go along as you think of them. So thank you so much for your giving us your time, John. Um, I'll hand over to you now to give us a bit of a background. Thank you and uh, thanks everyone who's joined. Um, I've just simply called this talk PARP inhibitors. Um, it's obviously quite a complex and ever-evolving uh, area of treatment at the moment. Um, I've tried to make the slides as up-to-date as possible uh, in terms of where we are at the moment with access to the various different PARP inhibitors. I've tried to keep it as unscientific as possible. There's a little bit of science in there um, just to help explain how these drugs work and why we use them. Um, and if there's any questions anyone has, maybe more complex than what we've covered, feel free to ask. Uh, if things don't make sense uh, as well, feel free to ask. Um, so just a brief summary, I was going to talk a tiny little bit about treatment in ovarian cancer and how that's evolved over the last 30, 40 years, really. Um, uh, and that brings us to sort of what, where we are with PARP inhibitors. So I was going to talk about what they are. And I thought it'd be useful to sort of compare uh, the various different PARP inhibitors that we have available to us now in the clinic, because I'm sure it's an area of much discussion as to you know, why we may offer one PARP inhibitor and not another and, and when we use them. So I'll talk a bit about how we administer them, uh, interactions between other drugs, how the side effects may differ a little bit, and then sort of licensing and indications you know, when we use them and why. And just at the end, I've just got some brief case reports. Just, uh, I hope that maybe helps explain uh, in context a little bit about when we might use which part of the system and why. So ovarian cancer um, is a treat as a, as a disease where we, we have one very good drug that we use a lot of and lots of other drugs as well. But main drug that we use, as you probably know, is, is carboplatin. Um, and carboplatin is our sort of go-to drug because we know that uh, ovarian cancer is usually very sensitive to carboplatin um, when we first use it, uh, with you know, around 90, 80 to 90 percent of women with ovarian cancer having a really good response to carboplatin-based treatment. And for some women, that's all the treatment they'll ever need, along with surgery. Uh, but in some women, uh, we know the ovarian cancer can recur. And very often, we were treated again with more platinum-based treatment. But in women with ovarian cancer, where the cancer maybe recurs again and, and recurs again, uh, and, and they have more treatment, eventually we start looking to other drugs, drugs that aren't carboplatin-based, because we know that the cells can become uh, less sensitive, less responsive to carboplatin-based treatment, and we look to use other drugs um, instead. That's all this slide is telling us. We also know that there's lots of different types of ovarian cancer, and I won't dwell on this too much, but the commonest type being what we call serous ovarian cancer. Um, and these cancers start on the cells that line the ovary or the fallopian tube. And we know that the serous ovarian cancers um, have specific genetic makeup that is a little different to um, some of the other types of ovarian cancer, like clear cell or endometrial cancers uh, of the ovary. And we commonly see, or more commonly see, abnormalities in the, the BRCA gene or in genes that do a similar job in the cell to BRCA. Um, and these genes are all involved in a process called homologous recombination. And I'll talk about that a bit more uh, in a few slides time. This, um, this slide just really shows the, the, the drugs that we've used to treat ovarian cancer over the last 60 years and how things have changed. So 
In the late 1950s, we were using a drug predominantly called cyclophosphamide, which we still use today, mainly in a tablet form. Uh, back in the, in the 50s and 60s, it was being given intravenously through a drip. Um, and then some other drugs like melphalan. And it was only in the late 70s that we started using platinum. Um, cisplatin being the first platinum-based drug that we had available to us. And we really saw significant improvement in the effectiveness of chemotherapy when we started using platinum, cisplatin at that time. Since then, other drugs like atopicide had come along. And in the late 80s, we found carboplatin, which is a very similar drug to cisplatin, a sister drug, as you like. But it's, um, it's generally a drug that has slightly less side effects. And over time, carboplatin has really uh, overtaken cisplatin as the mainstay of, of drug treatment for ovarian cancer. And you know, over the last 30 years, other chemotherapy drugs like paclitaxel and gemcitabine, uh, topatec and docetaxel, these are all uh, sort of classic what we call cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs that have made their way into the cancer clinic. More recently, over the last 10 years, we've uh, developed and, and, and learned more about what we would call targeted therapies. So drugs that aren't like chemotherapy, they don't sort of damage the DNA or the replicative apparatus within cells, but they target specific genes or proteins um, that may be driving growth of the cancer cells, or that um, may be uh, proteins within cells that make, make the cell more sensitive to certain drugs. And the main drugs there are the PARP inhibitors, so Alaprib, Niraprib, Capirib, and also drugs like Avastin, which targets blood supply to cancer cells. And also there's been quite a lot of studies on immunotherapy drugs like Pembrolizumab with, with varying um, results. So um, why do we use platinum so much in ovarian cancer? This is just a bit of genetics. Uh, this chart just shows if we were to take a person with ovarian cancer, we were to take their tumour um, to the lab and undertake something called genetic sequencing. That's when we take, the, we take DNA from the cancer cells and we look at all the genes and all the proteins and any abnormalities that we might see there. We, we see that in around 50% of women, there is some form of abnormality in genes involved in a process called homologous recombination. Now, homologous recombination is uh, one of the pathways within our cells that's involved in repairing damage to DNA, what we call a DNA repair pathway. And DNA takes two forms in, in a cell. It's either a single strand, so just one strand, or uh, when it replicates itself, it becomes a double strand. So you get two strands of DNA. And, uh, what we can see in those strands is sometimes we see mutations, so an abnormality. And a, if there is an abnormality in both of those strands, then that's what we call a double strand break. And homologous recombination is particularly important at repairing these double strand breaks. And it's these genes like BRCA, and other genes like HALB2 and BRIP1 and lots of other genes uh, that are involved in repairing damage to DNA through the process of homologous recombination. And if there's an abnormality in any of those genes, we call that homologous recombination deficiency. And because of how platinum works, by causing double strand damage to DNA, and because ovarian cancer cells commonly have abnormalities in the homologous recombination pathway, that's why platinum is very effective at treating ovarian cancer cells because of the way platinum works and the abnormality that's already present within the cells. Now we know that there are a group of patients, just under 50%, where that pathway is not so abnormal. And these are the patients who probably uh, respond slightly less well to platinum. 
And there's a lot of research, and it's not really something we'll cover in this talk, but there's a lot of research into looking at drugs that are more effective in this group of patients, where there are other genetic uh, aberrations or abnormalities within the cells. So, why do we use PARP inhibitors? You know, they're not platinum, but we know that in patients who have responded well to carboplatin, they would often benefit from PARP inhibitors as well. And that's just about how PARP inhibitors work. So PARP inhibitors really utilize the fact that a lot of ovarian cancer cells have an abnormality in homologous recombination. And HRD stands for homologous recombination deficiency. So PARP inhibitors target that. And they actually really use a process that we've learned about called synthetic lethality. And synthetic lethality means if there's a cancer cell that already has an abnormality in it somehow within a gene or a process, and we target another process within that cell with a drug, that drug, the process that that drug is targeting, utilizes the weakness that's already within the cell because of another abnormality, and it can lead to death of that cancer cell, destruction of that cancer cell. And that's how PARP inhibitors work. So what is PARP? PARP is a protein in cancer cells. Actually, it's in all of our cells, not just cancer cells, normal cells as well. And it's involved in what we call base excision repair. Base excision repair is just another DNA repair pathway that's involved in repairing breaks or mutations in the DNA in single strands. We've mentioned that BRAC is involved in double strand breaks. PARP is involved in repair of single strand break. So what happens when we give a PARP inhibitor? We give a PARP inhibitor and that prevents repair of any single strand breaks in the DNA that may occur. Single strand breaks occur all the time in our cells. It's just part of the natural process. And PARP is there to repair that, to make sure genetic abnormalities don't continue within that cell and then it divides and continue. So when we inhibit PARP with drugs like Alaprib or Nirapirib or Rucaprib, that leads to single strand breaks within the cancer cell DNA. And when that cancer cell decides to divide, double, the first thing it does is it, it replicates its single strand of DNA. So the single strand becomes a double strand. It's a direct copy. And so if there's a single strand break in the one strand of DNA, and that gets replicated, and you then get two strands, you get what we call double strand break. So in a cancer cell where we give a PARP inhibitor, you get lots of double strand breaks in DNA. Now in a normal cell that doesn't have a mutation in BRCA or a mutation in any of these other genes, that are involved in homologous recombination, the cell process will repair this double strand break by a homologous recombination. And the, the DNA is repaired and in theory, the cell can survive. In ovarian cancer cells or, the, or, or a lot of ovarian cancer cells, when there's a mutation in the BRCA gene or other genes involved in homologous recombination, which we know is common in over 50%, these double strand breaks don't get repaired. Homologous recombination doesn't work. There's no repair. And the cell detects this. And it says this isn't normal. And it initiates a pro process of what we call programmed cell death or apoptosis. And that's how PARP inhibitors work cause single strand breaks, which become double strand breaks. The cell can't repair them, and the cell initiates a process of cell death. And that's how PARP inhibitors can destroy ovarian cancer cells. So deep breath after the science. Um, PARP inhibitors are used in various situations, and I know it's quite confusing for a lot of patients and relatives to say, you know, why are you using a PARP inhibitor? Why aren't you using a PARP inhibitor? Why are you using that one and not another one? And it's an ever-evolving space because 
the, the trials of PARP inhibitors are ongoing in different settings and their licensing and approval is ongoing and, and ever changing. But I've generally split them now into three areas. Where do we use PARP inhibitors? We use PARP inhibitors as what we call a maintenance therapy. So in patients who've had chemotherapy and just completed them. We can use them as a monotherapy, so in, as a treatment on its own, not, not directly after some chemotherapy. And very recently, there's been data on the use of PARP inhibitors in combination with other drugs. So just going back to maintenance therapy, so we do use PARP inhibitors in patients who recently had carboplatin-based treatment and have responded well to it. So that can be in, in newly diagnosed patients. So in patients who've been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, have had chemotherapy, plus or minus surgery, they finish their chemotherapy. And in, in the old days, we used to then stop the treatment and watch. And we now have access to PARP inhibitors as a maintenance treatment. And there's been quite a few studies, and I won't talk about them in detail, but what those studies have shown is that PARP inhibitors can be successful at preventing recurrence of the cancer or prolonging the time between completion of surgery and chemotherapy and a patient needing more treatment for recurrence of the ovarian cancer. So recurrence does not happen in every patient, but we know it can do. And these drugs can help prevent that, or they can prolong the time between finishing chemotherapy and when the cancer may start growing again and need more treatment. And we call that the first line maintenance setting. Now we also use PARP inhibitors as a maintenance treatment after chemotherapy in patients who have a recurrence of their ovarian cancer. So these will be patients who had treatment initially for the ovarian cancer and at some point in the future the cancer starts to grow and they need more treatment usually with platinum based treatment sometimes with surgery as well and there are studies that have shown PARP inhibitors can again prolong the time between chemotherapy or surgery or both and the patient needing more treatment for recurrent ovarian because of course we know if an ovarian cancer has recurred once, we can often treat it successfully again, but that there's a very high chance that at some point in the future, some more treatment will be needed. So that's PARP inhibitors in the maintenance setting. Now, PARP inhibitors can be given as a monotherapy, so on their own in certain situations. That's mainly in patients with mutations in the BRCA gene. And I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. And there's some very recent data from a trial called the Paolo 1 study, which has shown a benefit of giving PARP inhibitors. This study was a LAPRIB. Um, in the first line maintenance setting, so in patients who had uh, a newly diagnosed ovarian cancer, had surgery, have had chemotherapy with Avastin, so this drug Bevacizumab or Avastin, and we can now add a Laprid to the maintenance treatment with Avastin in patients who've responded well to treatment and who have had a tumour test that shows that the tumour has homologous recombination deficiency. That abnormality I mentioned earlier that's present in around 50% of patients. Now, although this combination is now licensed, it's not something that is approved yet by NICE or the Cancer Drugs Fund. So it's not a combination we can use on the National Health Service at the moment, but this is a treatment for patients who have private health insurance or what have you that could be accessed now because the licensing is, is approved. So they're the situations where we can use PARP inhibitors commonly in the ovarian cancer clinic. So how are these drugs given? Well, there are some differences, which is relevant when we're talking to patients about which drugs to use and why. Alaprib was the first PARP inhibitor that we had available to us to treat patients with ovarian cancer. 
The trade name is Lim Parza, which you may have heard. Initially, the drug was only available to us in capsules. And those patients who have experienced that will tell you that they had to take eight, and some are still doing so, but eight capsules twice a day. And it had to be over eight hours from the last time they ate food. And they weren't allowed to eat for around two hours after the tablet. So it was eight capsules twice a day and there were lots of restrictions around food. So it wasn't the easiest thing to take. Um, logistically more than anything else. Since the development of the capsules, uh, AstraZeneca, who made the drug, have developed a tablet formulation, which is much easier to take. And this is, if patients are now taking a laparib, the majority will be taking tablets. And the full dose, the starting dose is 300 milligrams, so it's two times 150 milligram tablets, twice a day, and the good news is with the tablets, it doesn't matter whether it's before or after food or an hour. Or timing around food doesn't matter. So the tablets, I think, make administration of a laparib a lot easier. Another PARP inhibitor you may have heard of is a drug called Nirafrib that's now made by a company called GSK, previously Tazaro. And the trade name is Zajula, which you may have heard. Of. This is generally quite an easy um, formulation to take. It comes in capsules, which are a little bit smaller than the Alaprib tablet. It's only once a day. And the full dose is 300 milligrams, so three times 100 milligram capsules only once a day. But the majority of our patients now start on 200 milligrams. And that's because over time, in the last few years since the trials were done, we've realized that if if a patient is under 77 kilograms or their platelet count is less than 150, the 200 milligram dose is probably the right dose for them. And the 300 milligram dose might be a bit too high. And that's something we've learned since the initial trials were done. So the majority of patients are under 77 kilograms and the majority start on 200 milligrams. And we wouldn't look to increase that to 300. And it can be taken with or without food. And then the third PARP inhibitor that we use commonly in the ovarian cancer clinic uh, is a drug called Rucatrib or Rubraca. This is a tablet, so again, a little bit bigger than the, than the Rapid capsules. And the starting dose is 600 milligrams. They come in 300 milligram tablets as well as smaller tablets. And so the starting dose is usually two times 300 milligram tablets twice a day. And again, it doesn't matter around food. So I'm just going to talk briefly, and there's a lot of text in these next few slides, but these just really cover what the licensed indications for these drugs are at the moment, i.e. when can we use them on patients or in patients, for patients with ovarian cancer uh, within their license indication. So a Laprib has a license as a maintenance therapy, so after chemotherapy, in the first line setting. So women who are newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer, who have been found to have a mutation in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, either in their germline, so through a blood or a saliva test, that means a test of their normal cells, not cancer cells, or through what we call a somatic test, a test of their tumour. We know around 20% of women with ovarian cancer would have been born with an abnormality BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene, what we call a germline mutation. We also know that around 5% of women with ovarian cancer will not have been born with an abnormality in these genes, but will have an abnormality in those genes in the tumour. And that's because the normal gene has become abnormal during the process of the cell becoming a cancer cell. But it's important that we test for both. Because if we only tested the germline, we would miss 5% of patients who would benefit from a PARP inhibitor in this setting. So a lap rib is used in the first line setting in patients with a BRCA mutation as a maintenance treatment after chemotherapy is finished, as long as those patients have responded well to that treatment, meaning the, the, the cancer has shrunk 
or has gone away completely, has become invisible. And we can access that drug through the Cancer Drugs Fund. Alacrib is also used as a maintenance therapy um, after initial treatment of ovarian cancer, regardless of BRCA status. So in, in women who have a BRCA mutation or who don't, in women whose cancer has recurred, relapsed, and who have had some more platinum-based treatment and have responded. So a maintenance treatment in the relapse setting after good response to carboplatin, regardless of BRCA status. And then the third very new indication is that one based on the Paolo 1 study that I mentioned on the last slide. In a maintenance therapy in women newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer who have been found to be HRD positive on a tumour test and who have been treated with platinum-based chemotherapy with Avastin and whom this treatment has shrunk or cleared the cancer. And although it's licensed in that indication, it's not yet funded on the National Health Service. So Neratrib, uh, a different PARP inhibitor, that's licensed now very recently um, as a maintenance therapy in patients newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer, so first line maintenance, if that patient has what we call advanced ovarian cancer. And that's just the stage. It means it's stage three or stage four. Stage three essentially meaning that some of the cancer cells have spread outside of the pelvis into the tummy. And stage four meaning that the cancer cells might have spread into one of the organs in the tummy, like the liver, or outside of the tummy like the lung, for example. So we can do that regardless of BRCA or HRD status. So Rapid can be used as a maintenance therapy in women who've been newly diagnosed with stage three or stage four ovarian cancer, who've had surgery and chemotherapy, or well, not surgery, but just chemotherapy, and responded well. And we aim to give Neraprib uh, based on the study, we, we can give it for three or four years. should have mentioned that here, actually, in the maintenance setting, in the first line setting for a lap rib, we tend to use it for two years and then stop, unless there's anything visible on the scan stick. In the relapse setting, we use PARP inhibitors as a maintenance treatment for as long as that drug is benefiting someone and as long as it's well tolerated. And that can be many years in some so the other time that we use the rapid, the other indication, is again similar to a rapid in patients who have relapsed ovarian cancer. We give it as a maintenance treatment after response to platinum-based treatment, regardless of BRCA or HRD status. And again, that's through the cancer drugs. Fund. And Recaprib is very similar to the rapid in terms of the license, except we don't have access to it in the first line setting. There's no data yet. So it's not a drug we would give as a maintenance treatment in women newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer, whereas we could with, with Nirapib or Alaprib. But Rocaprib is licensed as a maintenance treatment in women with relapsed high-grade ovarian cancer that has responded well to platinum. And that's through the Cancer Drugs Fund and that's regardless of BRCA status. And the difference with Recaprib with, with any of the other PARP inhibitors is that we also have a license indication for its use as a monotherapy. So on its own, not after chemotherapy, on its own. So it can be used as a monotherapy in women with relapsed ovarian cancer that has recurred, so relapsed, and is growing what we call progressing, um, after at least two platinum-based treatments in patients that we can no longer give platinum to if there's a BRCA mutation. So in ladies with a BRCA mutation who have relapsed ovarian cancer and in whom we don't feel we should be giving platinum to, even, either because we don't think platinum is going to be very effective or because we think platinum is not going to be well tolerated, 
we can use recovery. Now, it's not funded through the NHS. It can be accessed through the a compassionate use scheme, which is where the drug company pays for the drug for free. Um, and that's been particularly uh, available to us during the COVID pandemic because it's allowed us access to a drug that's probably slightly less toxic than chemotherapy in this group of patients. So they're the three drugs and the indications for them. And it's quite complicated, but I hope that makes sense. So, you know, I'm just going to talk in the next couple of slides and, and the case studies really about, you know, why we might choose one drug over another, because you can see why, um, you can see in those indications there that there is some crossover. There are some situations where we have a choice between a lacrib and recaprib, or a choice between a lacrib or a recaprib. And which drug we suggest and which we advise comes through discussion with patients, but also through our own experiences and other things that we might think are relevant. And drug interactions is one thing. So these drugs are different in terms of how they may interact with other drugs. And that's all to do with how they work. So there are enzymes or proteins in our liver called the cytochrome P450 enzymes just see on these slides these abbreviations and, and they're different enzymes involved in this pathway different proteins and these proteins are involved in metabolizing um, drugs when we take a drug they get dealt with by the, the liver or the kidneys and, and um, they get changed and they get usually expelled from the body uh, after that um, through the liver or through the kidneys and some PARP inhibitors affect the cytochrome P450 uh, pathway more than others. And that's relevant because if there's a patient who's taking lots of different drugs, there could be some interaction. So we think about that when we're prescribing the drugs. Nirapirib doesn't really affect the cytochrome P450 pathway. And therefore, there's very few interactions with other drugs with nirapirib. So it's not a big problem. Recaprib is slightly more involved in affecting these cytochrome P450 enzymes, but we still see very few issues with drug interaction. Alaprib is a bit different. Alaprib um, affects the cytochrome P450 pathway quite strongly and is affected by drugs that affect the pathway and can also affect drugs that are involved in that pathway. So there's a lot of text on here, but the main takeaway message here is that with Elaprim, we do have to be careful uh, with interactions with drugs that patients might be on or with drugs that we might want to start in patients who are already taking Elaprim. It's particularly important for a lot of antibiotics. A lot of antibiotics which we, uh, we use do interact with this same pathway, so we have to be careful. It doesn't mean that it's very dangerous. It just means that we have to sometimes consider uh, lowering the dose of a a little bit if you're taking an antibiotic for all of this. Another important thing is, like with some other drugs, grapefruit, for those who like grapefruit, um, is a drug that can affect the cytochrome P450 pathway and actually patients who are on a tend, tend to be told to avoid grapefruit. It's just one of the nuances of uh, medicine is grapefruit. The drugs differ slightly in terms of side effects as well, um, and that's relevant when we're talking to patients about, um, about drugs. So we've talked a bit about um, the setting which they're used. We've talked about uh, the administration. So some drugs are once a day, some are twice a day, some are capsules, some are tablets. These are all things to take into account. Some people struggle with swallowing big, big tablets, for example. And the other thing to take into account is, is side effects. So there's differences between the drugs in, in side effects. There's some side effects that are common between them, but some that are slightly different. Nirapirib, anyone who's taken Nirapirib will know that when we start Nirapirib, we ask patients to come back every week initially for a blood test. And the reason we do that is we know that in around 50% of patients where we start Nirapirib, the blood counts can drop quite quickly particularly the platelets. And that's more, most commonly seen in the first month of treatment. 
So we bring patients back every week to make sure they're not one of those patients where the blood count drops quite quickly. If the platelets do drop or the hemoglobin or the white blood cells drop quite quickly, we have to stop the drug, what we call a dose interruption, until those blood counts have recovered. And then we have to decide whether we start the nirapirib on the same dose, depending on how severe the, the drop in the counts were or how long it was for, or whether we lower the dose. So we continue on the same dose or we lower the dose. So the difference with nirapirib and the other two PARP inhibitors is these weekly blood tests and actually blood pressure checks as well. So we have to do blood pressure checks every week. In women who get through the first month without having an issue with blood counts, we then check the blood test two, week late, two weeks later and two weeks after that, and then it's every four weeks. So it's a bit more intensive in terms of blood tests and monitoring initially than the other part of it. Another common side effect, sorry, of nirapirib is uh, insomnia, so it can affect sleep. You can get a bit of sickness with it and some tiredness. They're the main side effects of the rapid. Obviously, like with all these drugs, there's a whole list. I've just tried to focus on the most common ones and the differences between the different part inhibitors. So a lap rib, I think the main side effects with a lap rib are, uh, are it can make you feel a bit more tired and it can make patients uh, feel a bit sick. Um, and we give these uh, we often give anti-sickness drugs with the alaprib. Interestingly, these side effects tend to improve over the first two months or so. I think some of that is because we're giving alaprib to patients who very recently finished chemotherapy. And so they're already recovering from some of the side effects of the chemotherapy. But I think also the body sorts of gets used to these side effects as well. So fatigue, diarrhea, nausea, the common side effects. Low blood counts is less of a problem. We do see a bit of anemia sometimes, but we tend not to see such um, significant drops in, in the platelet count. So we tend not to do any blood checks in the first four weeks, but we do them every four weeks. And there tends to be slightly less dose interruptions or dose reductions with alaprib because of blood count issues than say with nirapirib. One of the side effects we see a bit more commonly with it Olaprib, I would say, is, is arthralgia, so aches and pains in the joints. Again, there's a whole list of side effects, but these are the common ones. Recaprib, I would say, is fairly similar to Olaprib in terms of the side effects, not so many issues with blood counts, a bit of sickness, fatigue. It does upset the liver function tests a little bit more than, than the other two. So um, when we take blood every time, every month, uh, we, we do pay particular attention to the liver function blood tests because occasionally they get a little abnormal or what we call deranged. Uh, so it's something we keep an eye on. And another thing I've not put on the slide, but something that's common across all the PARP inhibitors is that the creatinine level in the blood, so that's a blood test that we use to measure kidney function. Um, the creatinine level can go up a little bit on all of these PARP inhibitors. And in almost every patient where we see that, it's not because the PARP inhibitor is damaging the kidneys or affecting the function. It's just the fact that these drugs affect the exchange of creatinine between the blood and the kidney. And they're affecting the filtration of, of creatinine, but that's not actually affecting the kidney function. So it's usually something that we watch, but that we don't worry about. Neither should you. Occasionally, we just do some extra tests to make sure there's been no damage to the kidney, which is incredibly rare. It's just something these drugs do on, on, on the kidney function blood results. So that's all I was going to say about the, the, the drugs. I've got a few cases. What time is it? Uh, okay. I'll just run through a couple of cases then, um, and then take questions. This is um, a study of a this is a case of a 58-year-old lady who was newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer, so first-line setting. And she completed surgery and chemotherapy with a good response. She was found to have a BRCA mutation, and she didn't take any concurrent medications. So we could offer this lady a PARP inhibitor. She's responded well to 
older pattern. She has a BRCA mutation. We could actually offer her a lacrib or niracrib as a maintenance treatment. And it's likely, I would say, in this situation to come down to personal preference of the doctor or the patient. The second case study is very similar. It's identical, except the patient doesn't have a BRCA mutation. So first line treatment, had surgery and chemotherapy, good response, no mutation in the BRCA gene, no concurrent medications. We can't offer this lady a lacrib in this setting because she doesn't have a BRCA mutation, but we can offer her niracrib. So niracrib would be the choice of PARC inhibitor in this patient. I'll move on to uh, study four, because this is just a patient who could be offered any of the PARP inhibitors, and then, I, and then I'll finish to take questions. This is a 58-year-old lady um, who's had a relapse of her ovarian cancer. It's platinum sensitive, so it's responding well to platinum. And there's a mutation in the BRCA gene. She doesn't take any concurrent medications. On the National Health Service, we could offer a lacrib, recaprib, or niracrib. And that might be an experience if there are any patients listening that you may have had and you may have wondered why. And I hope this talk sort of explains why. And um, there is evidence for the use of any of these drugs and there's license for the use of any of these drugs. And for all the sort of reasons we covered in this talk, one might suggest a lacrib over a caprib or a lacrib over a caprib. Um, and that will come down to you know, discussion between us and, and the patient. So I'll finish the talk there because I'm conscious I've been talking a while and there may be some questions. Um, thank you so much. That was so useful. I've learned so much um, in, in that time. Um, I will um, put some of the questions across that we've had live today um, and also some of the ones that we've had um, beforehand. Um, a really good question um, from someone who's here just now. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of PARP inhibitors, are they equally effective in BRCA patients and those without? Is there a significant difference and why has it come about that kind of BRCA patients are more likely to be eligible for them? So I suppose there's two questions there. So the first question I think would be, are PARP inhibitors as effective as each other in whichever setting we're using them? And I think we have to say yes. Um, there have been no studies that have directly compared the effectiveness of one PARP inhibitor with another. But when you look at the, so most of them have been studied in what we call placebo controlled trials. So where half of the patients get the actual PARP inhibitor and half of the patients get a placebo, so a salt or sugar tablet. Um, and when you look at the benefits of the drug versus the placebo in each of the studies, they're pretty similar in terms of whatever outcome measure we're looking at. So they're almost certainly as effective as each other. We know that these drugs are more effective in patients where there's a mutation in the BRCA gene than if there's not or in patients where there is a mutation or an abnormality in a gene like BRCA involved in homologous recombination. So in patients with homologous recombination deficiency, they're also more effective. So these drugs are probably most effective in patients with a mutation in the BRCA gene. They also can be very effective in patients without a mutation in the BRCA gene, but HR deficiency. And actually, studies have shown they can also be beneficial over a, a placebo or over doing nothing, even in patients who don't have a BRCA mutation or don't have homologous recombination deficiency. And that's why drugs like, well, that's why all the drugs do have a license in certain settings, regardless of BRCA status or HR. Um, and we've had a couple of questions about that, about finding out whether you do have HRD. So, uh, and, and is it available to have that test? Because someone has said they've not been allowed to have that test. So how does someone go about finding that out? So it's a complex, very complex topic. Um, HRD, so I think there are a few HRD tests available. And I think it's fair to say that none of them will capture 100% of patients with HRD. The, the most validated test is a test uh, called Myriad My Choice, which is um, a, a test made by Myriad, a 
it's a tumour test. It's not available on the National Health Service um, at the moment. And the reason it's not really, I think, is that we can give PARP inhibitors in most of these settings without an HRD result. And if we can't, we can with a DRACA result. So the test is about three or three and a half thousand pounds. It's available for people self-funding or through insurance companies that the insurance company will pay. And we've been a bit of a full circle with HRD because when, when PARP inhibitors first came out and they were only available if there was a, a BRCA mutation or HRD, we were, we were trying to get HRD tests as much as possible. And then when PARP inhibitors became available regardless of HRD status, we stopped doing them so much because we decided whether we wanted to give a PARP inhibitor based on whether someone was responding well to platinum more than anything else. And now, particularly with the, the Paolo 1 data, where we can add a laparib to a vastin in, in the private setting, in the patients with HRD, we're now starting to do HRD testing in that group of patients. So it's a complex test. It's not offered on the National Health Service. The most validated test is the Myriad MyChoice test. There are others, but they've not really been validated with clinical trials. Um, but eventually, the NHS is going to have to decide how they're going to test HRD, whether that's going to be with the Myriad test or their own sort of in-house test at the genomics hubs that we now have, um, is a sort of watch that space. Thanks, Something you. that can be done privately. Um, we had a couple of questions about kind of the current world events. Um, and so for firstly, whether PARP inhibitors make a person more vulnerable to COVID and then with the, the COVID vaccine, whether there's any worry at all that if you're taking a PARP inhibitor, um, it might either the impact the effectiveness of the, of the COVID vaccine or vice versa, could the COVID vaccine impact um, your PARP inhibitor treatment? So again, COVID is still, it's been around for too long, um, still quite new to us from in a lot for a lot of these questions, um, but but we do have guidance that we're, we're giving to patients. The first is, you know, do PARP inhibitors in, increase someone's risk of developing COVID? I think the first thing to say is I think there's lots of other things that might increase someone's risk of developing or catching COVID, and that's you know, where you're spending your time, whether you're wearing a mask, washing your hands, all these measures to that everyone could be using to reduce the risk. PARP inhibitors do lower your immunity a little bit, but probably not to the same degree as chemotherapy. But the government guidance throughout the COVID pandemic to patients taking PARP inhibitors has been generally to shield in the same way as someone having intravenous chemotherapy has been having. Now, I think one can certainly argue the immune system is stronger on a PARP inhibitor than it might be on chemotherapy, but that's been the general guidance and it's been hard for us as doctors to suggest otherwise. In terms of the COVID vaccine, it's fine to have, so the two COVID vaccines we have available at the moment in this country are the Pfizer vaccine, which is an RNA vaccine. It's, it's a dead vaccine, it's not a live virus. Or the AstraZeneca Oxford one, which is um, actually comes, it's, it's, it is a virus, it's an adenovirus from a chimpanzee. Uh, that's the vector that is used to deliver the vaccine, but it's not replicating in humans. So it's not what we call a live vaccine. It's not something that's an issue for patients who have a lower immune system. So both of them are fine to have if you're having a PARP inhibitor or in fact chemotherapy. And then the third question is, when should you have it? Um, are there any interactions? And so we're not stopping uh, we're not suggesting people suspend their PARP inhibitor for a week or what have you before they have the, the, uh, the vaccine. We are suggesting that if the neutrophil count, so the white cell count, is below one, you should probably wait until it's above one. And that's more the, the, the vaccine is more likely to work if the immune system is a bit strong. Um, and so that's really the guidance in terms of timing of the vaccine and, uh, and PARP inhibitors. There's no interaction that we know about between the vaccines and PARP inhibitors. 
Brilliant, thank you. I had a really, really interesting question. Um, so if you have a somatic BRCA mutation, so in your tumour cells, and you later have a recurrence, will that recurrence, the cancer cells, still have a BRCA2 or a BRCA mutation, or could it then be BRCA negative? Yeah, so the answer is um, either scenario is possible. Um, even in someone who's newly diagnosed and has a, a BRCA mutation found in the tumour, that BRCA mutation may not be within every cell. It's what we call heterogeneity. So we tend to give a percentage when we do a tumor test. We will say there is a BRCA mutation in 90% of the cells or 5% of the cells. And that can change. And it can certainly change after treatment because you could imagine the cells that have the mutation in the BRCA gene might be more sensitive to the PARP inhibitor. We might get rid of most, if not all, of those cells. And we might get rid of all of the other cells as well. So there's probably a slightly higher chance of the cells, if there are any, that don't contain the BRCA mutation being resistant to the PARP inhibitor. And if we test the tumour again, we might see more or less cells with a BRCA mutation. And we're trying to get around this question a little bit with blood tests. So you can do a blood test and you can detect what we call circulating tumour DNA in the blood. And we can sequence that DNA for BRCA mutation. So there are ways of us now sort of surveying perhaps whether there's a tumour BRCA mutation and um, how much, how many of the cells, you know, what proportion of the DNA contains a BRCA mutation uh, through the blood. And that's something that will probably become more and more used as time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we had um, quite a few questions from people who are taking PARP inhibitors and the question being, if you are on a PARP inhibitor um, and it stops working or you have a recurrence whilst taking it, is it possible to start taking a different PARP inhibitor or is it a different treatment option at that point? So I suppose there's a few relevant things here. If someone's having a PARP inhibitor and we stop it because we don't feel it's being beneficial anymore, we wouldn't, ad we wouldn't advise switching there and then to a different PARP inhibitor. If someone stopped a PARP inhibitor because they're not tolerating it well, we could try a different one. Um, if someone stopped a PARP inhibitor because it was working or, uh, and has now stopped working, we would likely advise some more chemotherapy with or without surgery, depending on the situation. And if that chemotherapy is platinum, carboplatin again, and that patient benefits from the carboplatin. On the National Health Service, we do not have access to PARP inhibitors a second time, be that the same PARP inhibitor or a different PARP inhibitor. There are a couple of clinical trials at the moment that may give access to a PARP inhibitor in that situation, but they're placebo controlled, most of them, so a patient may get the placebo, they may get the drug. Privately, um, we can do it because th the drugs are licensed. There's nothing in the licensing of these drugs that says we can't re-challenge with the same or a different PARP inhibitor if that person is responding to platinum again. We don't have much trial data to back that up yet, but the trials I mentioned just then that we're doing sort of re-challenge with PARP inhibitor trials, once those trials report, we will have more information as to whether it's something that's beneficial to be doing or not. And I think for some patients it will be, and for some it won't be that way. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we also had quite a lot of questions, um, both, li both live and previously, um, from people who've been on PARP inhibitors for uh, a long period of time, so some people for several years, and the questions are about um, what the long-term impact is on general health, and are there any risks that they should be worried about? So the long-term side effects of the PARP inhibitors, from what we know, and we've got 10 or 15 years of data now from the early trials, um, is that there aren't really long-term side effects. The one thing, the one thing that's always questionable, and it's probably something that the, the, anyone who's having a PARP inhibitor will have been consented for when, before they started, was this very small increased risk of bone marrow issues with PARP inhibitors 
of something called myelodysplastic syndrome or a form of leukemia called acute myeloid leukemia. Now, these are effects that we thought were caused by PARP inhibitors initially. In the first, in the initial trials of PARP inhibitors were generally in patients who've had five or six or seven lines of chemotherapy over many years. And we saw rates of acute leukemia and myelodysplasia of around 3%. So about three in a hundred women in those studies developed this. Now, we might expect in that population to see in, in heavily pre-treated pre uh, patients rates of that around maybe 2% or 1.5%, so it's slightly higher than we might expect. Since then, the trials that have been done earlier in, in patients' treatment pathway, perhaps in patients who've only had one line of treatment, the rates of AML and myelodysplastic syndrome are much lower, probably under 1%. So I would say that that's probably the only long-term um, side effect that we've probably seen, and it's much lower than we thought it initially was probably affects well less than one in a hundred. Thank you. Um, and just as a last question that's popped up that but be really useful for people to know, um, you've mentioned kind of getting involved in clinical trials. How does somebody listening today go about getting involved or finding out what trials are available at the moment? It's a good question. And I think, you know, we're still, even in the age of the internet and everything else, not great at coordinating information on where there are trials. The, the second thing to say is at the moment with the COVID pandemic, some of the trials are slowing down again just at the moment. Um, they did slow down last year, they reopened and they're just slowing down a little bit. The main thing is to ask your doctor. If your doctor doesn't know or isn't interested, then ask for a referral, it depends on where you're being treated. Ask for a referral to one of the, perhaps if it's a smaller center where you're being treated, a referral to one of the bigger uh, ovarian cancer centres where trials may be more common uh, or to certain specific clinical trials units like at Hammersmith, like at the Marsden, like at the Sarah Cannon, um, where they will know a little more. There are databases, so the CRUK website is quite good for patient information. The OCA website has some information on clinical trials. So again, the charity websites are quite good as well. It's hard for patients to do their own research on these things. It's Lots of subtle uh, eligibility criteria for a lot of the study. You ask your doctor, they're not helpful. Ask them to ask another doctor. I think that's really good advice. Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of our time now, and I'm aware that we had um, we didn't get through every single question. So I know some of the ones that came in beforehand hopefully were answered by um, John's amazing talk. I think that was so informative. I, I know everyone listening will thank you, John, for giving us your time. Um, I know you're incredibly busy, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, we have recorded today, um, so it will go up on our website shortly, and I will make sure to send around everyone who signed up um, the link so you can view it later on. Um, and if you do have any questions, please do get in touch at bracker at ovarian.org.uk so thank you so much and thank you again john and um, giving us your time and hopefully to see you all again soon thank you thank you thank you